afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange program with the University of Florida. Thank you for joining us today. Today I'm excited about our presentation with Dr. Neil Flanagan, visiting assistant professor at Duke University. Today Dr. Flanagan will be giving a presentation sharing some of his recent research on the impacts of fire on peatland carbon dynamics. I'd like to take just a quick moment to share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. SFE is a regional program for fire science delivery in the Southeast. We're a collaborative among the University of Florida, Tall Timbers Research Station, NC State University, and the US Forest Service Southern Research Station. We're sponsored by the federally funded Joint Fire Science Program, and we are the Southeastern branch of the Nationwide Fire Science Exchange Network. Working with our network of partners, we develop programs, opportunities, events, and webinars like this one that help to bridge the divide between the fire science and natural resource management communities. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Neil Flanagan is a visiting assistant professor at the Duke University Wetland Center. He obtained his PhD at the Ohio State University where he now researches and publishes on the topics of biogeochemistry, hydrology, water quality, and wetland restoration. And he also teaches classes in wetland ecology and wetland field techniques. So thanks everybody, we're glad to have you on the line with us today. Uh, welcome Neil, we're looking forward to your presentation and everybody right. one second as we just trade out slides. Thanks for this opportunity to uh, present my research to this Southeast fire, Southern Fire Exchange. And um, I wanna begin by talking about the research on how low severity fire in particular can essentially protect or, uh, or enhance the storage of, of carbon in global peatlands. And this is a part of a DOE funded project uh, with the Duke University, Duke University Wetland Center where we were looking for lat latitudinal trends from, uh, from Canada to Peru and looking for factors that influence the, um, the ability of peatlands to store carbon. And part of that project was, was my interest in fire. And particularly this all began with my observation that one, that many peatlands across, especially the temperate and the boreal regions have fire adapted vegetate, uh, plant communities and have all, uh, often have those plant communities have been present throughout the entire period of development of the peat column. And then also that, that fire is a recurring disturbance in these ecosystems. And so the question became, Typically, we view fire in peatlands as a, as a destructive force, and the question became, is fire always a destructive force? And are, are there some scenarios where fire is not actually destructive or could actually be protective of some of the uh, organic matter that's uh, uh, accumulating in, in these peatlands? And so just a quick outline of the talk objectives today. I'm going to begin by talking about what is a typical fire scenario in peatlands in terms of severity? And often we see a lot in the news about very high severity, uh, very destructive peatland fires that have occurred in Indonesia, in Canada, for example. And obviously for a lot of obvious reasons, these are events that emit a lot of carbon into the atmosphere and uh, receive a lot of media attention and public attention. And so, it's natural that researchers would, would, researchers would tend to focus on these kind of fires, but I wanted to step back a little bit and ask to what extent are these high severity, very destructive fires typical? And can we look at low severity fires and lower severity fires and see how, whether they might be more typical uh, within peatland ecosystems? Then I wanna talk a little bit in a general sense about what are the mechanisms by which thermal alteration by these fires could could enhance or alter soil organic matter in peatlands, especially in the surface layer. Then I want to talk about uh, how fire and, and, and alteration of soil organic matter could affect the microbial populations in, in, in these peatlands and, and the rates of decomposition. And also look at how, looking at the mechanisms by which uh, 
uh, or look at the relationship between the census temperature sensitivity of decomposition Q10 and the thermal alteration of organic matter by fire. And then more specifically toward the end of the talk, we're gonna focus in on, on our results and our study and, and, and see what the, you know, so some of the really interesting results that we, we've seen that are published in a recent publication in Global Change Biology, uh, where we look at how fire could actually, low severity fire could potentially be a protective mechanism for peatland organic matter and then talk about our conclusions. So begin, let's, so as, I've, as I alluded to, when we think of peatland fires, often we think of the kind of high severity fires that we saw in Indonesia back in 1997, where so, some individual fires are, are, are over the course of a fire season that too much CO2 was released in the atmosphere that was equivalent to about 15% of the global emissions from, from fossil fuel uh, burning uh, in the human ecosystem. Um, we also see examples, these are pictures of a really severe fire, the Evans Road fire in the Pocosins Lake National Wildlife Refuge and the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge back in um, 2008. They released as much carbon as, as it is emitted by the entire government uh, um, a motor fleet in a given year. So th these are, you know, th th these peatland fires can, can be extreme emitters and can be very important in the, in the global sense but the question is, are they representative and are they typical? And I wanna maybe sway your perception a little bit and talk about the possibility that, that most of the fires that occur in peatlands or in wetland areas are actually surface fires that occur typically in the, in the late winter or early spring when the water table is relatively close to the surface, uh, soil moisture levels are relatively high, and there's a tendency of these fires to burn uh, desiccated dormant vegetation and heat the top layer of, of, the, of the soil profile, the top few centimeters, but not actually uh, combust the, the surface layers or start smoldering fires that, 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 that result in some of the massive carbon losses that we see in, 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 the, in the high severity fires. and present sort of an alternative endpoint of, of wetland or, or peatland fires that might occur in an example here of a prescribed burn in the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge where we have these uh, shrubby evergreen peatlands that were burned during the late spring and March in this case uh, that produced very intense surface fires that rapidly heated the soil surface. But as you see, you see in the picture here to the right, um, maybe I can look at my pointer options here. Uh, leaf litter is charred, but, but is largely unconsumed by the fire. And we also have, are left with a lot of charred above ground biomass that eventually ends up falling down on, on the peat surface and becoming part, part of the peat profile. And then after about two years, the fire is, is not intense enough to really have an impact on the below ground biomass of the shrub community. And within two years, we have substantial resprouting of, of that community and um, and we're starting to store carbon again. And we also used uh, some remote sensing data sets. In this case, the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity, MTBS, put out uh, by the uh, USGS and partnering with the Forest Service, I believe. And we were able to look at um, the burn severity classes of different of, of wetlands in uh, Florida, Minnesota, and North Carolina, some of our study sites. And we see a trend here where most of the peatland fires or wetland fires are occurring during the spring. Let me uh, play with my pointer options again. Here we go. And that we see when we've looked at the proportion of, of burned acreage that are in different burn severity classes, we find that the majority of them are unburned to low and, and low severity classes. And we look at the cumulative total of acreage across, the, across these three states, um, we see that 90% of the, the acreage is in those lower burn severity classes and only about 10% are in moderate or high severity uh, in, in most fires. And this is over about 20 years. Uh, we did, this, did the same thing in Alaska, did the same exercise looking at burn severity of fires in wetland areas. <clears throat> 
And again, we see the majority of fires are increased greenness, unburned to low severity or low severity. And those, those three classes make up about 60, 65% of the total, total fire area and moderate to and, and high severity are only about, uh, about 30%. And finally, I go to a study that looked at burn severity classes of peatlands in, in, in Alberta, Canada, and the investigators, uh, Bourgeau Chavez, and um, uh, who's in Turetsky's lab, um, they looked at, uh, they, they began by examining what, what season of the year most of the peatland fires occurred in Alberta, and they, they found that the vast majority of, of those fires occurred in the early season in the spring. And then they went about classifying four large fires uh, and, and looked at the burn severity classifications. And again, we see the same trend here where the majority of the areas are either unburned or lightly burned. And a relatively small area has moderate, moderately light to, to, to moderate burn severity. So we, again, we see the same pattern where high severity fires are, rel even though they, they can be very in influential on a global scale, they're, they're not as common as some of the le less severe fires. And so what are some of the key features of low severity fires? Well, the major feature is that the amount of heat that's transferred from surface fires to the underlying peat is insufficient to dry and ignite, ignite that peat and initiate smoldering fires. And those smoldering fires are the ones that really cause the major loss of carbon. And again, some of the key features are the timing that they tend to occur mostly in the winter and spring when water tables are close to the surface and soil moisture is high and we have dormant vegetation and we have lower air and groundwater temperatures. And also with the low severity fires, we have low to moderate fuel loads. So if we let enough of a fuel load develop in any site, if we have a, a very high fuel load, we can probably cause the ignition of a, a, of a smoldering fire regardless of the conditions on the site to some extent. And then finally, we have sort of typical weather conditions in, in, in these late, late winter and early spring, absence of drought conditions. So I'd like to move on now and talk a little bit. So I've laid out this scenario of what I mean by low severity fires, where we're talking about perhaps intense surface fires, but, uh, but because of the moist conditions of the underlying peat, we don't get the ignition or, or get very little loss of, of, of organic matter from the surface of the peat, and we don't get ignition of smoldering fires on, on the underlying, underlying soil. So now talking about I would like to talk about some of the fire history of peatlands. And as I alluded to earlier, the, the fact that uh, the idea that in most of the, a lot of the peatlands that we examined, at least in our studies, that we found this long-term history of, of fire throughout the peat profile. And I'll begin by talking about one of the Carolina bays that occurs in Cumberland County, North Carolina. And this is from a study by Buell in 1946, where he's one of the first people to go out there and start coring and looking at the nature of the cores in these Carolina bays. Uh, and he found that, um, I'm gonna rearrange my, something here so I can see my own screen a little better. Okay, that within these peatlands within the coastal plains of North Carolina, throughout the entire profile of peat, they found that the, these, these systems have never been completely free of fire and that they find charred fragments throughout the entire profile he found that there was a blacker layer of peat on the top that experienced more, that was probably more hemic and had experienced uh, more frequent fires. But even in the underlying browner material, there were still peat fragments throughout, throughout the entire profile indicating that fire had been a, a part of these ecosystems for their entire history of development. And he's also referring to the fact that he finds charred trees and, and, and burned trunks through, throughout the posit, uh, that continue to add charcoal throughout the entire period of accumulation. Uh, we also allude to the fact that um, there's a question that I've had in the past about whether if fire had been part of these ecosystems throughout the, their entire period of development and the fires were occurring in the early spring and late winter, what was the cause of these fires? Because you know it, it doesn't seem plausible that lightning is the only cause of fire under that scenario. And so, there's been several studies that Fowler and Kaepernick here is one example, where they looked at the plausibility of, of human-caused fire regimes in the southeastern coastal plain in the southeastern United States. And they, they typically found that 
yes, indeed, that uh, the Native Americans and we're, we're ma actively managing the, the landscape using fire all the way back into uh, 12,000 12, years before present. And they were typically using low intensity bushfires that they were setting, uh, we'll see here, um, some ethnological historical evidence that the Indians or the Native Americans were burning during the, the uh, autumn and late winter or early spring. So there's a possibility that these late winter, early spring fires um, have been supplemented by human human management throughout the entire uh, history of accumulation of some of these peatlands. Another example here from two other bays in, in North Carolina, and we see a couple things here. First of all, we see in Jones Lake and Singletary Lake, which are again in Bladen County and Cumberland County, North Carolina, the presence of macro char throughout the entire history of development of these peatlands. Uh, here. And we also see um, associated with macro char is actually an increase when, when, when we see this transition from uh, predominantly mineral soil to predominantly organic soil. And then the, the, the authors of this study thought that human intervention or human, human management had may have been a factor in changing the community composition from a oak dominated system to a pine dominated system and they weren't certain whether uh, the increased uh, uh, accumulation of organic matter was was caused by this transition or was or the human intervention caused this transition or whether the organic matter accumulation uh, was, was the result of it so but we do see that as, as we get more carbon more from from fire more and more macro char we're seeing a transition from predominantly mineral soil to organic soil. So at least in this case, uh, the fires did not seem to inhibit the accumulation of, of, of carbon within these peatlands. And as we see, when we look at the accumulation rates, we actually see a, a upward, a, a, an increase in the slope of the accumulation rate recently that's associated with these, um, with the increased presence of, uh, of, of charcoal in the soil profile which is certainly not, not unusual to see a, an increased rate of, of, of accumulation uh, in, in, more, in more recent times, but it certainly indicates that fire was not inhibiting accumulation of carbon accumulation in these systems. And as we look at fire in intact tropical peatlands, uh, in, in this case in Indonesia, we kind of see the same trend. Where we look at, I have circled here. Let's see if I can move my, here we go, all right looking through a vertical uh, peat profile within an Indonesian peatland. Uh, we look at the number of fire peaks per thousand years and the rate of carbon accumulation. And we see again, uh, we see evidence of fire throughout the entire history of the peatland. And we also see some indication that if there's not at least a positive relationship between carbon accumulation and the number of fire peaks, there's not a negative relationship. So it seems in this case that that, that the fire frequency is, is not uh, negatively impacting carbon accumulation, at least until very recently when, when we have dra drainage of the peatlands and um, much more intense fires occurring. And we see the same general pattern in another Indonesian peatland again, where uh, the peat accumulation rate does not seem to be negatively impacted by fire frequency. And again, we see fire as part of the ecology of these ecosystems throughout the entire period of peat accumulation. Got a little rumble, rumbling of thunder in the background here. Um, and we can then also go to look at uh, peatlands in, in, this, in the Canadian boreal peatlands, in this case in Quebec, and a study by Van Bellen um, and, and uh, Berigeron. And um, so again, we see two examples of of boreal peatlands in Quebec where, where fire and, and carbon peaks are, are occurring throughout the period of carbon accumulation in the peatlands. And in this case, they actually found that there is a, a, a very weak positive uh, relationship between the number of fires or fire frequency and the carbon accumulation rate. Um, and what they're, they're the, the conclusion of the authors in this case was that again, that uh, 
that fire was not a, a major factor controlling carbon accumulation in these wetlands. And the fact that autogenic and allogenic factors on site were more important. So again, we see fires present throughout the entire period of carbon, carbon accumulation. And that you know, fire does not have a, negative, a major negative impact on, on, on the rate of carbon accretion. But we will point out that so low severity fire may have been uh, com fairly common in, in many peatlands throughout the globe over the past, but uh, several studies, especially by uh, Kasitsky and Turetsky, I'm sorry if I butchered, butchered your name, um, that essentially shows a, a pattern of, of increasing fire sizes, fire size between the 60s, 70s, and uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, where the size of, of boreal fires was increasing. And we also see a relationship from Turetsky that uh, as the fire size increases, the depth of burn also increases. So we have an indication of a trend of, in, of, of recent increase in fire severity. So, so while low severity fires may have been present in peatlands uh, over the past, climate change and human drainage in, in many peatlands may be making fires more, more severe and more intense over time. So that the, some of these mechanisms I'm gonna be talking about today will becoming, uh, maybe becoming in, increasingly irrelevant. So what are the mechanisms, the potential mechanisms by which uh, the soil organic matter could be altered by fire, particularly low severity fires? Uh, and, and the mechanism that I'm gonna touch on today and, and, and discuss during in, in the results of, of our research. Um, first of all, uh, fires can uh, selectively move label, label uh, fractions of organic matter. So they, they tend to remove things like polysaccharides and, um, and sugars and starches and leave some of the more calcitrant of stable forms like lignans, et cetera, and, and pyrogenic material. So you, you have an increase, uh, an, an increase in the ratio, ratio of, of labile components of organic matter to stable components of organic matter that, uh, that actually resembles humification. Uh, we can also have an alteration of the physical structure of soil organic matter and particularly, we're going to focus on the development of hydrophobic and aromatic coatings on soil aggregates within the peat that can result in, in actual physical protection of peat. It can make that organic matter inaccessible to microbes. And then also, we have what we expect with, typically with fire is the formation of charcoal, very stable charcoal or black, or black carbon fractions, pyrogenic material that generally very resist or relatively resistant to decay. And another mechanism is that we can have, fire can actually result in changes to the microbial community. And, and often we, uh, associated with those changes in both uh, microbial biomass and, and microbial community structure, we can have change, de decreases in the rates of respiration. Uh, so one example again from the Carolinas of the selective removal of um, of label, label organic matter fractions. This is um, work done by Rollins back in 1992 that was from the Snuggety Swamp in South Carolina, which is a, again a coastal, a coastal peatland that's dominated by evergreen shrubs and, and um, things like Persia and uh, uh, Merica, I'm sorry. So and what he looked at here is, is in his vertical profile with a depth from zero to 125 centimeters is that we see the presence of, of charcoal peaks throughout the profile indicating that the fire is a, a continuous part of this, of this uh, um, peatland community. But we also see associated with these charcoal peaks is an uh, increase in the ratio of, in this case, lignin to cellulose. Again, the ratio of recalcitrant material to relatively labile material or stable material to labile material. And then we also see an increase in the ratio of, of aromatic compounds within the peat to aliphatic compounds or, or aromatics to, to sort of fats and waxes. And these are both indicative of, of this selective enrichment of the recalcitrant portions by fire. Uh, another study done by Wu et al. This is a laboratory study looking at, um, at heating of a boreal peat material, uh, relatively low temperature, in this case about uh, 30 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes. And again, we see the same pattern where we see 
relatively high amount of, of, of sugar, sugars in the, in the peat material in the raw samples. And then after a relatively short period of heating, in this case, 20 minutes, we get a, 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 a large reduction in the amount of sugars present and an increase in the amount of uh, aromatic compounds. So again, removal of the labile, less stable or more st or less stable compounds, more microbial accessible to microbes, and an increase in the proportion of stable or, 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 or recalcitrant compounds or aromatic compounds in this case, happening very quickly. Um, moving back to North Carolina, we have some work done by Su Susan Hodgkins at Florida State University. And she looked at uh, the mass, spectrom uh, mass spec uh, results looking at the ratio of hydrogen to carbon and oxygen to carbon. This is basically a, a Van Crevelin diagram. And we see in this diagram in the lower right here is that uh, carbohydrates tend to be in the upper right quadrant of, of, of these diagrams. They're materials with relatively, relatively high, high amount of oxygen and hydrogen, so carbon bonded to oxygen and hydrogen. And as we move down toward the uh, zero here, and in, in this region, we have more condensed aromatics with carbon is bound to carbon, and a very, very resistant material. And then in the middle here, we have lignans. And as we can see from these diagrams, the first is the DNL at the top here, the, the, the blue dots. That's one of our sites that hasn't been burned in over 30 years, and it's been a, a very long period since the, since the most recent fire. And as you can see, that's up in the region of our Van, Van Crevelin diagram where we expect to find car more carbohydrates and proteins. As we look at the effect of fire, in this case, uh, a prescribed fire that got a little bit out of hand and got a little more and burned down in the peat a little bit, these red dots here, these are definitely down more into the region of recalcitrant materials like lignans and condensed aromatics. So again, we seems to indicate a selective removal of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And we see the same thing here, although to a lesser degree in a more recent controlled burn at Picosin South, uh, the, the yellow dots here. And again, we see uh, that the two sites um, partition out from each other. We can, we can make out the DNL site distinctly from the, the burn site here at Picosin South, but, it, but it, they're not as discreet. So this fire was not as hot. And so we see more of the, a little bit more of the carb, possible carbohydrates and, and other more labile materials. Okay, uh, moving on. So that's talking about selective removal of, um, of relatively available, available uh, microbial available soil constituents. And now we're gonna move on to talking about uh, development of hydrophobic films on soil aggregates. And we'll talk about a scenario here where we have again, a low severity fire, a fire burning surface material. In this case, like we might have in our Picosins, burning off the ericaceous evergreen shrubs, maybe po possibly reaching the very high temperatures uh, in, in the surface fire, but because the underlying material is moist, uh, that the temperatures in the soil are not as high. And essentially what we're doing is then we have a, a, a gradient of decreasing temperature as we go down in the soils. And the fire itself is actually mobilizing in this case, fats and waxes and volatilizing them. And they're actually being transported as vapor down in the soil and then cooling and depositing on the under underlying material in the soil, resulting in a scenario here before fire where we have a, a layer of uh, tip of peat is often water repellent near the surface with a wettable layer underneath it that's exposed to fire and then we have this scenario over to the right here where we have enhanced uh, water repellent, uh, enhanced water, water repellency or, or, or soil or hydrophobicity in the surface layers. And the, also the, the thickness of that water repellent layer is increased as well. And so we, in, one, in some of our laboratory exercises, we kind of see the same thing happening where we took unburned litter from our precocins and put them into a muffled furnace and we had the development of what's typically called coffee ground or soil aggregates uh, in, in our laboratory experiments where we have these uh, very hard, very, uh, very discrete soil aggregates developing in, in our muffle furnaces that, that resemble coffee grounds and they're, they're very hydrophobic as well. 
And so other, so other studies on boreal peat again has uh, kind of recreated what we did in our, our laboratory experiments, put uh, boreal peat into a muffle furnace. And again, we have selective enrichment or, or selective removal of label compounds and, and concentration of recalcitrant compounds or stable compounds. I know some people don't like the word recalcitrant. But they found, and we're going to come back to this in a bit, that the primary mechanism by which this increase in uh, soil water repellency occurred was by a re rearrangement of, of basically long chain fatty acids on the surface of the soil organic matter, where it was a removal of water that caused um, hydrophilic, uh, hydrophilic materials, hydrophilic surface uh, functional groups on the soil organic matter were converted into hydrophobic functional groups on the surface. And so and they illustrate this here with, a, uh, with the, with the um, water, water, uh, water drop test showing angles of greater than 90 degrees after they've treated it. And then and this happened very quickly, actually. And we'll see in the next slide that they put both moist and dried peat into a muffle furnace. And they, they, they saw that within uh, within a few minutes, let, in, in a tenth of an hour, that there was a big change in the um, water drop penetration test. In other words, the soil became much more repellent. And the soils remained repellent, water repellent, until we went to at least out more than uh, almost half an hour at, um, in this case, at uh, 300 degrees Celsius. And then if you left, left the peat material in, the, in these heating conditions long enough, Eventually, you burned off those those fatty, uh, fat, waxy and fatty materials, and eventually you had to return to hydrophilic peat material. Um, if if you left it, uh, if you get, if you uh, subjected it to heat for a long enough period of time, and of course, talking about as we expect in most fires, the most obvious mechanism by which fires would uh, alter carbon chemistry is development of biochar or charcoal. As you can see in this example from a prescribed fire in the Pocosins, uh, we have quite a bit of uh, biochar generated that will eventually fall into the soil and become a component of uh, charcoal or black carbon component of the soil that would tend to be more recalcitrant or stable. And talking about, so how does that affect uh, the, the microbial functions of the rates of decomposition within peatlands and how, how, do microbial, how does the microbial biomass respond to wildfires? wildfires? Uh, Dooley and Trester did a uh, meta-analysis of, of fire literature from about 35 fires and they were able to identify about seven studies that looked at boreal forest fires. And they found in most cases, they had a decreased response ratio um, after, after fire. So the response ratio would be the ratio of, in this case, uh, microbial biomass in burn sites to control sites. And if it's less than one, it's basically indicating a reduction of microbial biomass in response to fire. And so on most of the fires that uh, from time zero all the way out to about 15 years after a fire, we have a uh, a decreased amount of microbial biomass in, in most fires, boreal fires that are subjected to, and most boreal forests that are subjected to fire. And then we also see a relationship between the microbial biomass response ratio and the CO2 respiration response ratio. So that's essentially showing that when we reduce microbial biomass, we're also reducing rates of microbial respiration and presumably uh, decomposition of, of soil organic matter. And then another study by Holden et al, we see again that the same pattern where unburned sites have higher rates of basal mi microbial respiration than burned sites in both black spruce and, and white spruce aspen forests. And we see that the, uh, the degree to which uh, basal respiration is affected by fire is a function of fire severity. So as fires become more severe, uh, we have a bigger, a larger reduction in microbial respiration. So now talking, moving on a little bit to talk about uh, temperature sensitivity decomposition. Um, this is an idea where we look at uh, rates of decomposition using the Arrhenius equation. And 
essentially is talking about the, the change in the rate of decomposition for each chain, 10 degree increase in, in soil temperature in this case. And we see that if the Q10 or the, uh, is one, the Q10 is equal one, the, 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 the uh, soil organic matter is not, not sensitive to changes in temperature. And as we go up, uh, as we increase that Q10, we get a bigger and bigger increase in rates of decomposition. So for example, with a Q10 of two, for each 10 degree increase in temperature, we get a doubling in the rates of, of, of microbial respiration and, and decomposition. So typically we have viewed the relationship between the carbon quality of, of peat and temperature sensitivity to show that as we have relatively simple substrates that are readily accessible to microbes, we have low temperature sensitivity. So, and as we increase the complexity and, and the stability of organic matter, we increase temperature sensitivity. Now there have been several studies by, by Davidson and Janssen's for example, and, uh, and other authors, uh, Conant is another one, but several authors have brought up the idea more recently of something called uh, apparent temperature sensitivity, which means this intrinsic sem temperature sensitivity of, of orga soil organic matter, which again is based on carbon quality, is moderated or influenced by environmental constraints. It's ideas of whether organic matter is sorbed or desorbed from, for example, um, metallic complexes in soil, whether soil is aggregated, uh, whether it's um, arranged in, in strong aggregates that would tend to inhibit microbial access to soil organic matter or unaggregated, whether the site is aerobic or anaerobic and frozen or unfrozen. And we also looked at the question of whether uh, we might have coatings or, or structural or physical barriers to microbial access that might be created by fire. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Oh, so we look at occluded versus unocluded. And so the general trend is that when we're looking at car soil organic matter carbon quality, generally we expect to have simple uh, carbon, that's a carbon quality of, uh, of simple or, or, or label or, or readily available materials for microbial respiration. We have low Q10 and we get up to in the complex or recalcitrant forms of organic matter, we have high Q10s. But we also note that uh, the apparent Q10 can be constrained or unconstrained depending on how easily microbes and, 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 and microbial enzymes can access soil organic, soil organic matter. And we look at again that the idea of protection or wh whether organic matter is protected or unprotected. We can have things like uh, soil organic matter being protected through affinity with uh, mineral, co mineral complexes and in in, with the mineral components of soil. Uh, covalently bound, are of high affinity interactions with metals within soils. In our case, we're looking at the question of whether soil organic matter can be occluded by, by other materials. In our case, we're going to be talking about hydrophobic substances that could occlude or prevent or limit the access of microbes to soil organic matter. So moving on to our research, Again, we did this research as part of a, my, I did this research as part of a bigger project where we were looking at uh, latitudinal trends in, in soil organic matter and the decomp decomposability of soil organic matter. And we looked at four different sites, one of which was located in Minnesota at the uh, Marcells Experimental Station. One site was located in the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. Our third site was located in the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge in Florida. And our first, fourth site was located at the Los Migos uh, Biological Station in Peru. And so um, the site in Northern Minnesota was a, a black spruce a sphagnum peatlands with relatively cool summer temperatures, um, relatively high water temperatures where the water was typically within a foot of the soil surface uh, during the summer and a fire return interval of between 50 and 150 years. In Pocosin Lakes, we have an evergreen shrub community, uh, evergreen shrub peatlands with relatively high summer temperatures 
a seasonal drop in the water table that can go down as far as uh, 1.2 to 1.5 meters below the soil surface and fairly frequent fires. Fires are turning every five to 25 years. In the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, um, again, we have a sawgrass community and that's behind the photo, but uh, again, high summer temperatures, uh, seasonal recession in the water table and frequent fires, the fire turn interval again about every five to 25 years. And finally, in the uh, Los Migos uh, peatlands in Peru, uh, Mauritia palm peatlands, uh, fairly stable water table, precipitation's pretty constant throughout the year and there's very little water table uh, variation and the fire return interval is greater than 500 years. So the methods, we, we monitor to prescribe burn at the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. We were asking a question, what does sort of a, a low severity fire look like? And so we had this prescribed burn where we monitored above ground temperature of the above ground fire, uh, the soil temperature that were experienced on a, on a vertical profile throughout the soil during the fire itself, and how far, how moist the soil was and how far down the water table was during the, during the burn. And we collected soil and litter samples before and after the fire. And then we also collected soil litter samples from our sites in Minnesota, Florida, and Peru. And then using muffled furnaces at the Duke, Duke University lab, we mimicked our prescribed burns in all, with all our soil cores where we subjected the cores to uh, temperatures of 450 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes with moist soil conditions. The soil moisture was uh, 350%. And then we uh, rapidly cooled the samples. And after it was cooled, then we reseeded the burn material with, with a slurry, a small, or the, a, a small amount of unburned material or slurry after cooling. And then we incubated, aerobically incubated the soil material at uh, three temperatures for six months, 5, 15, and 25 degrees Celsius. And we analyze the structure of the burn material using XPS, FTIR, and um, scanning electron microscopes. Uh, we did an elemental analysis of the material that was burned in our experimental treatments. And essentially we found that the, there was very little change in the bulk characteristics of the soil between our burned and unburned material. Things changed a little bit, but not, not much. Um, but we did go in and look at the, with S scanning electron microscopes, look at the surficial changes to the litter material at the top of the soil. And this is an example of SEM image, images from our unburned material, where we see it. This is an example of, uh, of leaf material from, from one of the shrubs on the site where we can see the, uh, the stoma are clearly visible here before the fire. And then after the fire, we look at the same images of the same kinds of material where we see the stoma barely visible here, but there, it's occluded by deposition of a layer of, in this case, material that's, um, when we zoom in on it, it looks a lot like the material, the, uh, the, micro, the uh, microspheres that were de deposited on hydrochar during its development. And if you don't know what hydrochar, this is basically an engineered recalcitrant soil amendment that's produced by heating wet organic matter at temperatures between 180 and 100, 260 degrees C for between five minutes and two hours. And it results in a process on, on the surface that resembles colification. So we have the de deposition of these microspheres on the surface of this organic matter uh, that, that resulting from this, this treatment. Uh, looking at FTIR, Fourier transform infrared uh, scans of our organic material. Uh, we began by looking at samples of material, both from unburned material here in the green dotted line of, of just basically uh, unburned biomass from the uh, overlying shrubs. And we also have a red dotted line that we looked at um, materials subjected to 250 degrees Celsius for a few minutes. And then we looked at Lyonia, uh, the, the, the same material at a higher temperature, 450 degrees C, and we compared that to two, two samples from peat profiles at, at zero to five centimeters within our Pocosin areas and 
uh, five to 10 centimeters. And essentially what we see is that as we have increasing temperatures, we have removal of, of polysaccharides here at a, at a wavelength of 1090, 1090 uh, centimeters. And so we, we're, we're removing polysaccharides here. We're also removing cellulose. And we see that uh, the aliphatic materials, the fats and waxes are relatively unaffected. But we do also have some increases in the amount of aromatic materials in, in, in the soil. So we're essentially, we're selectively remo removing the, the uh, label components and concentrating the relatively rec recalcitrant components like aromatic compounds and fats and lipids. Uh, again, looking at, we see the same trends, just looking at uh, the material that we treated for our, our study. But we do see some indices where we looked at the ratio of aromatic compounds to carbohydrates that considered a humification ratio. So we see an increase in humification as a result of our treatments, although they weren't statistically significant, small but insignificant. And we also see an increase in the aromasticity of, of the material. So moving on, um, so one of the things I'll point out about our, our FTIR is that we did this on finely ground materials so that we were actually looking more at the changes in the bulk chemistry of the soil. And we really wanted to get at the question of what was happening on the surface of the soil aggregates. And to look at the surface of the soil aggregates, we turned to a procedure called FTIR, uh, X-ray, or I'm sorry, XPS, X-ray photoelectric spectro spectroscopy, where we essentially, we take X-ray beams and we, uh, we shoot X-ray beams onto the surface of the soil material that only pen penetrates about 10 nanometers into the soil material and look at the electrons that are, uh, that are excited or, or released as a result. And when we do this, we get a spectra, a C1, C1S spectra for carbon that looks something like this. And we, we fitted peaks for each of these for, for, at four different uh, binding energies. And they essentially represent four different classes of compounds. First of all, ar aliphatic or aromatic compounds, which are relatively stable, again, recalcitrant. And then we look at compounds that are bonded to oxygen, which are less stable, things like ether or hydroxyl compounds, carbonyl and carboxyl compounds. And what we see is when we compare the, the unburned material in the left graph here to the burned material in the right, we see uh, increased prominence of our, of our aliphatic or aromatic peaks here at 1085, which is basically indicating that we have a uh, increase in carbon condensation on the surface of the soil aggregates which is indicating that these films are, again, we're, we're, we're depositing thin films on the layer of these aggregates that are either aliphatic or aromatic and therefore relatively resistant to decomposition and could potentially limit microbial access to the underlying soil organic material. And of course, uh, we created some indexes again to look at the partition and look at the partitioning. And essentially this index here in the upper right hand corner is a carbon condensation index. And in all four of our, or three or four of our sites, we see a, a significant increase in carbon condensation with a p-value of 0 0.05 and at Peru it was, uh, was 0.1. So we see significant increases in carbon condensation on the surface of our soil aggregates. Uh, we then looked at also at the uh, effects of our simulated burns on microbial respiration. And at all of our sites, we see a, a, a decrease in the rates of, my, of microbial respirations or CO2 emissions in our incubations at our, burn, at our burn sites relative to our unburned sites that, that persisted for at least six months. And we fitted um, regression equations to each of those and then uh, used those equations to model cumulative CO2 emissions over the course of several years. Now, one of the things to look at down here in the lower right, we point out is that the, the point where the, uh, the red line meets the, the difference between where the red line meets the y-axis and the blue line of the unburned material meets the y-axis represents an initial carbon loss to fire. And we see that um, in all cases, 
our burn material had lower rates of carbon emissions than our unburn material. And in most cases, it took, we, we reach a crossover point in, in less than a year in, in Minnesota, about a year in Peru, um, about a little over two years in, in Florida, and what to say, about, about two years in North Carolina as well, where there's a crossover point where we actually have lower cumulative emissions from our burn sites than from our unburned sites. And of course, as we were mentioning before, we see a reduction in the Q10s in our burn sites as well. And that's consistent with the idea that the films that are deposited on the surface aggregates are actually inhibiting microbial access to the underlying organic material in our, in our, in our, uh, our simulated burns. And that, of course, that's indicating that again, that uh, we have an apparent re uh, reduction in apparent Q10 that's a result of, of, of structural changes on the surface of the soil organic matter that's limiting microbial access to the soil organic matter. So again, back to this idea that we have uh, protected organic matter that's, that's constraining uh, the Q10. And so what we see when we plot for all for our sites, the uh, carbon condensation index versus Q10, we see a nice pattern of a decrease in Q10 as we increase the carbon condensation index in, in all of our sites. So our unburned sites have uh, higher Q10s and our burn sites have lower Q10s and there's a, a nice relationship between the two. And it suggests that this carbon condensation index on the surface of the soil aggregates can largely explain this change in Q10. And so the conclusions is that uh, the thermal alteration of peat by low severity fire can, might be widespread in peatlands having uh, regimes of frequent fire. Large changes to bulk chemistry of soil are not necessary to influence the recalc recalcitrance or microbial respiration. Uh, direct organic masses to low severity fires are typically offset by reduced microbial respirations in one to three years. And that the long-term trends indicate uh, peatlands remain carbon, carbon sinks uh, with repeated low severity fires. Although we see that uh, with increasing fire severity associated with human, human alteration and cl cl climate change, that uh, we may be faced with increasing fire severity in the future. So quickly acknowledge the uh, Department of Energy grant and the Duke, Univers Duke University Wetland Center staff and students and uh, the staff of the folks that, that helped us at, at our field collection sites. Okay, and that, that's, um, that's the end. Any questions? Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Flanagan. Uh, once again, if you all joined us during the presentation, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. And that was a presentation from Dr. Neil Flanagan with Duke University. So at this point, uh, we would like to provide you with an opportunity to ask questions of Dr. Flanagan and his uh, presentation today. Uh, please use the Q&A tool in Zoom uh, to, to submit your questions, and we will uh, work to get through those uh, as best we can. Uh, seeing as we're at close to the top of the hour, I'm going to go ahead uh, before we get into the questions and post uh, in the chat window a copy of, or excuse me, a link to our webinar survey link and evaluation uh, so that you can provide feedback for your participation today in case you need to leave before we finish up the questions. And I'm also going to put in a link to the Society of American Foresters uh, CFE uh, survey. So if you are here looking for CFE credits for your participation, uh, then please use that link in the chat window uh, to provide your information. So I'm going to go over here to the Q&A window. Uh, okay, so if you guys have any questions, I see some are coming in right now. Uh, here's uh, one that came right in uh, from Kurt. Uh, Kurt says, do you feel that peat layers in historic southeast wetlands are increasing due to fire suppression of wetland basins via winter burns versus uh, summer or dry season burns? Um, 
Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes. So Kurt's asking if, if we're getting an increase uh, in, uh, in peat layers in the southeast due to uh, prescribed fires that are happening during uh, the winter season as opposed to during uh, the warmer uh, growing season. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I have enough information to say that it's a typical pattern of that low severity fires increase carbon accretion. I think it's, it's, po it's at least possible that they do, but um, I think I, I'm, I'm kind of stretching outside of my data to say that, but I do think that there certain, doesn't appear to be actually that the low severity fires don't appear to be hurting carbon accretion. And certainly what I'm concerned about is, um, you know, maybe somebody else will get, get to this question, but um, the question of do we exclude fires from, from peatlands, especially when we're trying to uh, manage peatlands for carbon, carbon credits or carbon, maximize carbon accretion. Uh, if we exclude fires, we can actually, one, be changing the nature of, of the carbon that, that, that's, a, that's accumulating in these peatlands, and it's going to be different from the carbon that has historically, from the peat that's historically, historically accumulated in these peatlands. But we're also secondly going to be increasing the above ground fuel load and increasing the, the likelihood that there could be severe fires or, or smoldering fires that would actually definitely have a negative impact on, on long term carbon accretion rates. Here's a, a question from Jed and Jed says, can you make any inferences to differences between Eurasian and North American boreal systems and fire severity? Uh, yeah, we did. I did look at that in the, in the literature review a little bit uh, for my paper, and it does appear that overall, that because of the nature of the vegetation, the black spruce forests and are and their highly flammable nature, that you do have a, a tend to have more intense uh, above ground fires when they burn, and you might see in in Siberian peatlands that are dominated by by larch, for example, or, or other species, and so. I think overall there, there's a tendency to have more intense and more severe fires in, in, in Canadian North American peatlands than we see in, in, in Siberian or Eurasian peatlands. That could change you know, as the climate changes as well, that, that, that could change. So uh, this, is, this is my question. Do you, does this work change your thoughts about uh, fire return intervals in, from a prescribed fire? Uh, perspective uh, for fire in these peatlands? Well, I did do, I had some tables where we actually looked at, um, that I didn't include in the presentation, but there are supplemental materials in, in the paper in, in Global Change Biology where we looked at various fire loss scenarios in terms of aerial losses and, you know, kilograms per meter squared. Um, and what we see is that uh, the fire is some of the fire return intervals described as between you know less than 10 years are probably not not real that we, if we had return intervals that were that frequent i think it's unlikely that these these peatlands would have um accreted carbon over the long period a lot over the long term uh so i think that uh, when we look at frost and other other people have tried to estimate return intervals uh those return intervals are probably on the longer end more like 25 years 10 to 25 years. Here's a question that came in from Robert and Robert says, can you comment on how the increase of invasive species, which probably have different chemical characteristics than the native ericaceous vegetation in wetlands might affect carbon accumulation in terms of hydrophobic films, et cetera? Um, yeah, I think, I think there, there's definitely, I think, depending on specifically, I mean, certainly with the invasive species, you're gonna to tend to have, again, back to having more above ground biomass potentially uh, that would increase the likelihood of severe smoldering fires underneath. Uh, and then regardless of the underlying material, I guess it depends on what, what the nature of the invasive species, whether we're talking about woody species or, 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 or graminoids, for example, and probably have to talk about a specific species to, to, to be able to, you probably couldn't make generalizations to invasive versus native without talking about whether we're talking about woody species or, or, or grasses, et cetera. There's a question in here from uh, 
Dorothy, and I, it's two questions, so I want to make sure that I try and uh, get this together. Uh, Dorothy says, Alaskan coastal peatlands show declines in carbon storage with drought. Uh, so prior to fires, do you, th oh, de declines in carbon storage with drought prior to fires. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think carbon storage declines in your peat transect? Uh, the, my peat tra oh, oh, um, well, I think, I definitely think drought, uh, you know, drought and um, drought and, and, and drainage are definitely going to have negative impacts on, particularly the fire regimes on those areas, and make severe fires more 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 likely and, and decrease the likelihood of, of low low severity fires. So in, the, in that respect, yes. I mean, if we drain them or, or draw it on the water table due to climate change, that we're increasing the likelihood of those severe fires, and that could definitely have an impact on on carbon storage in those on those systems. And here's a question that came in. Uh, it's the question is, is, is a quantitative estimation of microbial community uh, sufficient to understand the effect of fire? So uh, are there uh, other things other than microbial community uh, respiration or, or? Yeah, I think there's definitely some work at? that I would that I would like to you know that uh, we, some of the other folks in the, in the wetland center are more micro microbiologists than I am, but we would definitely look at shifts in the type of, of microbes, particularly uh, increase in shifts between the dominance of bacterial and fungi. But also within fungi, there, there, there are some uh, groups that are more slow growing than others. And certainly if we have if fire causes a shift from more quickly growing microbes to more slowly growing microbes, I, I would expect that to have an influence on the rate of respiration. I was I, interested. I would love to look at that question, yeah. I was interested in your uh, images from the scanning electron microscope uh, yes. to, to find evidence of uh, low severity fire effects in your laboratory tests. Do, do you think that technique could be used to identify uh, historical evidence of low severity fires in these systems? I think, uh, I think people have looked at um, looked at was well, particularly the definitely the scanning electron microscope can give you some when you look at the images some information about the burning temperature and, and how especially with woody materials and other materials how hot the fires were uh, and whether they're low severity or high severity but also uh, uh, some information about uh, the, I, th I think some people have, and some people are better at that than I am but uh, looking at the the, the structure of the carbon and, and this, the extent to which it's degraded can can be elucidated to some degree with with the images from scanning electron microscopes. How you know how, how intact the structures are, for example, uh, vascular structures and other things that you see in the images. All right, we're going to go to one last question that came in from John, and then we will wrap things up for the day. John says most peatlands have less overstory than historically present, and therefore less available litter for low intensity burns compared to shrub fuels. Do you think that this impacts comparison of historical fire return intervals? Um, no, I'm not. The, the lower, I, I don't think it. Not, not the. I don't really see it return influencing the return interval as much as the severity or severity, the, the the severity of the above ground burns and the heat transfer to the un underlying peat and the extent to which those fires are, are able to thermally alter the organic matter or, um, um, or, or increase the likelihood of, of severe burns. So yeah, it's, it's to the extent that, uh, you know, if you have a lot of, uh, of above ground biomass, you could uh, especially increase the depth of which the, to which the, the thermal alterations occur. All right, well, thank you very much. At this point, we're going to wrap things up. We appreciate all the questions that uh, everyone submitted. Uh, if you would like to follow up with Dr. Flanagan, please see his contact information on the screen. So Dr. Flanagan, uh, thank you so much for your presentation today. You covered a lot of material and I enjoyed it. And thank you all uh, for joining us online today uh, on Zoom and also those who joined us on Facebook. And we hope 
uh, that this webinar will be useful in your fire management programs in the future. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.